time right now is 8.30. Good Friday morning. Welcome to the WLBB Community Voice on News Talk 1330 FM 106.3. My name is Colin Worthington. This morning we are on the News Talk 1330 WLBB Facebook page. For uh, So uh, thank you to those of you tuning in there. You can see my handsome young guest this morning, local historian. One of the reasons he'll uh, talk about our topic this morning, but he's also uh, his sons are also directly in the line, in the family line of uh, the topic uh, that we'll be talking about this morning, so he could be considered an expert again. Uh, Curtis Spivey, our guest on this morning's Community Voice. If you recall last week, there was some hullabaloo, some brouhaha, because there were some concerns that uh, an iconic uh, building in uh, between Carrollton and Rootville was going to be destroyed. Uh, turns out there was actually just work being done on it, renovations. A family has taken care of it since 1950, I think. You can correct me if I'm wrong here in just a second. 1940 is when that was up and it's uh, just been an iconic uh, site since uh, since you know uh, for, for a long long time on US Highway 27 you can see it it's called the the Tater House and uh, we're going to talk about that the history you know a lot of people were were actually you know upset about it on online they were you know just you know why would you do something like that why would you destroy that i mean you know it is their property if they decided to do that and just couldn't afford it or whatever i mean you got to let that be but they're not doing it they're renovating it and we're going to talk about the history of it and, uh, and just, you know, how iconic this house is nationwide and even reaching out into uh, Canada and, and maybe even Europe. We'll talk about that this morning. Again, historian Curtis Spivey. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing great. And uh, thank you for coming out to talk about this it's and always ex- a explain a lot about this. The, uh, the family uh who owns that property they uh, they tolerated and allowed you to come out here and talk about this and and again you do your sons are uh direct descendants of uh the people who built that house absolutely so you should yes yeah, you, you'll know a little bit about it we'll take us back uh start us from the beginning here what's what's the official title of uh of this house the w w e johnson sweet potato curing and storage and in fact i want to talk about walter e johnson the man and the legend because he has become a legend and um, it's hard to imagine that in just a little bit of research i could go back family tree wise as far as the 1890s and uh, walter was the son of campbell polk johnson p-o-l-k and emily benet cannon So there's maybe some cannon towel money in there somewhere. (laughs) But uh, at any rate, uh, his family lived in Fayetteville, Georgia, some ways away. And odds are, from the lineage that came down from them, they were sharecroppers. And sharecropping was a hard life because you farmed hard all year. You did everything you did could do to make your family comfortable, but you also made somebody else comfortable because at the end of the year, you sold your crop and you gave it to the owner of the property, half of it, for being able to live in his house, using his land, and sometimes charging everything to the company store that uh, you would have to pay off at the end of the year. So it was a hard life to work yourself to death and then end up with virtually nothing. But their crops were corn and cotton and maybe a little bit of sweet potato Mm. just for good things for the family to enjoy during the year. And um, a sweet potato is something that I've always been familiar with because I've heard my mother talk about taking a tater, as she called it, and laying it on the hearth in front of a wood fire and letting it roast, turn it where it would roast. And then when it got done, her and her sister would take two spoons and scrape the potato out of the peeling and have something good to eat on a cold winter's day. So I'm familiar with the potatoes. But their, their crops um, were the potatoes and the corn and the cotton, and um, they were looking for a better place to be. Their son, Walter, was born in 1896, and by 1902, they was looking for a better place. Not only the amount they had to give the, the guy for tenant farming, but easier land to, to farm. And they found a place in northern Carroll County, up at Hickory Level. Now imagine packing up everything you own on a one-horse wagon, everything you own on a one-horse wagon, and traveling 42 miles. And odds are the daddy of this bunch walked by the mule because he didn't want the mule to have to pull him along. But the daddy would walk, but they came to Carroll County in 1902 and settled down in Hickory Level. And uh, it was a 
a con- congenial place to live because it was a crossroads. And so you had people coming and going, so it wasn't like you was being out in the woods, but you had people you could talk to, and these were churched people. They lived and and worked around going to church. They loved their singings, they loved their reunions, they loved their homecomings. And odds are, as Walter E. Johnson grew up, he attended all these things. And uh, as he got to be a, a mature man, he was fortunate enough to meet up with Ruth Cole, who he married. Now, it's odd, odd enough that me and Ruth Cole are cousins through the Jones family. So I'm sort of double cousins here. But uh, he married Ruth Cole, and uh, they decided that they had farmed, and they were sharecroppers. And just imagine working your entire life giving it to somebody else and having a bare thing to eat yourself. But they were sharecroppers, and uh, they decided that they was going to look for better places. But not only were their crops growing, but in uh, not in uh, 1921, the Walter E. Johnson family had Horace Johnson to come along. And Horace would be an important part of their lives in farming and eventually in the potato house. But Walter... But Horace coming along, he was born. He was born, right. Uh, Walter, there was Horace, Reba, and Wendell were the three children. But Horace being the oldest, he learned real quick how to farm and how to make a crop. Now, he loved baseball, and the kids were always playing baseball out in the field after the school time, but his daddy said, no time for games for you. We've got to make a crop. So it was hard times, and uh, like his dad, he learned what it took to make a farm, and uh, they decided that they was going to look for a better place too. And so they needed a better house and better land, and so they were off to Carrollton. And just south of Carrollton, uh, just south of where Stripling Chapel Church is, there's a BP station there now. They found some land. Mr. Alvin Walker had it. And he let them live in the house, and he let them farm. Now, they didn't see much of Mr. Alvin because he worked at Bell Bomber in Atlanta, and him and Miss Lydia lived in Atlanta in Marietta, and uh, they didn't have a car. Uh, So when Mr. Alvin came down to check on his land, he came on the bus, came on the bus to Carrollton. I'm sure it was Southeastern Motor Lines owned by Mr. Mm -hmm. Roop. And he came on the bus to check on his land, and occasionally Miss Lydia would come with him. But they'd have to catch a ride down to the farmhouse from the bus station. They did not own a car. But as time went on, it was getting hard for them having to give Alvin all all that they had extra after their living. And... uh, they decided they wanted a place of their own, a place that they could call home. And uh, thankfully enough, in 1939, Roosevelt had the FSA program, the Farm Services uh, Association, Farm Services Association. Was that part of the New Deal? That was part of the New Deal, and it paved the way for farmers to be able to afford a place to live. And so they were looking for land. And uh, the way this, way I understand it, way this payment program went, you didn't have to pay but once a year. You didn't have to make a payment but once a year. And so that would be when your crops came in similar to the uh, sharecropping, but at least you was owning your land. You weren't just giving it away. But uh, they were looking for land, and they found 120-plus acres down two miles north of Rootville, and they moved down there. Now, the land was rough. The land was rutted, didn't have any terraces on it. And there was an old house standing there with some outbuildings. So they moved down there. And oddly enough, they didn't live in the house. They got this loan, and they lived in the smokehouse in the barn. The two boys slept in the smokehouse, and the girl and the daddy slept, and mama slept in the crib in the barn. But they had a crew come in to tear the old house down. Lots of good heart pine in it, and they built them a new house, a new house. And let's talk about that new house in our second segment. Um, my guest this morning, Curtis Spivey, historian and, and good storyteller. I mean, you know, we, we 
could have some I could have some summarized everything you just said probably in two sentences, but it wouldn't have been nearly as entertaining. And uh, so we appreciate uh, you giving all the little details and and, and stretching out this story. Uh, we are discussing the uh, the Johnson family uh, here on this morning's Community Voice program, and uh, your association with the uh, Tater House, which is off of uh, U.S. Highway 27, iconic uh, building that you see going north and south um, in between Rootville and Carrollton and uh, came up in uh, discussions last week and there was concerns that uh, they were tearing that down but they're definitely not they're renovating that building and uh, we'll talk about how you can help uh, finance that I mean look it belongs to this family but uh, you know they've had to take care of that for years and years and, and it seems to me like they want to take care of it they want to keep it up as a as a location and as a building that people can see and uh, you know People take pictures in front of it, and uh, and when you say, hey, that building on Highway 27, you know exactly what they're talking about. But we'll take our first break here and come back and continue our conversation with Curtis Spivey. Time right now is 841 Community Voice, brought to you by Tanner Health System and Oak Mountain Academy. Health is a journey. It's making better choices, even when it's not easy. It's taking care of yourself and the people you love. At Tanner Health System, we're there for you with every step, with primary care, heart care, cancer care, women's care, orthopedics, surgical services, and so much more. We're dedicated to helping you live and feel your best. So let's get on that journey to health. You've got places to be for many years to come. Find us at Tanner.org. The customized academic scholar journey at Oak Mountain Academy is individually designed to provide students with a personalized, clearly defined academic track that earns the student a series of distinctions upon graduation. This journey enables academically driven students to pursue a focused, rigorous course of study personalized to their wants and desires. I'm Patrick Uran, head of school, inviting you to journey with us on the mountain. For more information, visit us at oakmountain.us. Discover your journey at OMA. Prepare, explore, and achieve. Eight forty two. Welcome back to the WLBB Community Voice on News Talk thirteen thirty FM one hundred six point three. My name is Colin Worthington. My guest this morning, Curtis Spivey, and we are talking about the uh, Johnson family. Started with them in the uh, late eighteen hundreds, and uh, got uh, got them into Carroll County. And their significance in this story, anyway, is that the uh, the owners of the Tater House, the iconic building that's off of Highway twenty seven. I think Joel Joel is showing a picture right now to those of you watching on News Talk thirteen thirty WLBB Facebook page. And uh, there was some concerns last week that it was uh, coming down after, uh, what, 40, 60, 80 years? 86 uh, yeah, years. Of being a spot. Uh, but, no, the family uh, is trying to uh, preserve that. And uh, the family members I talked to said, hey, we want to keep it up for at least another 80 years if we can. But it does cost money to keep something like that up. And they're uh, doing what they can to, uh, to maintain that and keep it going. Uh, so we're just talking about the history of that. We're going to uh, brought in local storyteller and a guy who does uh, has a little inside information with the Johnson family as well. Um, kind enough to uh, share a lot of information with us on this morning's Community Voice. So I am going to just turn it over to him now and just uh, take off where we left off for uh, uh, that first break. Curtis Bobby. Well, the Johnsons couldn't imagine. In eight weeks, they had a house torn down. All the nails pulled by the family, and the crew put them up a new house. They had not only a new house, but electricity and a brand new outside privy. So they were really rocking. But Walter Johnson knew that his cotton and corn and a few potatoes wouldn't be enough. So here comes the Tater House. Yes, sir. I'm sure that the county extension agency through the University of Georgia had the plans because the plans were fairly detailed and they just needed some hard work and some materials to get it going. So off off we go to do it. Now, Johnson's biggest help was before mentioned Horace Johnson. By this time he was 19 years old and he was out of school and he could do some arithmetic and he could do some planning and he could probably read the plans. The, The potato house called for it to be 16 feet, 9 inches wide, and 30 feet long. And uh, the house would need much work to get it done. The foundation was stones picked up out of the field, and vents put in the foundation out of screened wire. The framing was weatherboarding, got it a local sawmill, and then the interior was tongue and groove. And I just found out out something day before yesterday. The exterior was not lined with any kind of of chipboard or 
our uh, OSB that we see houses lined in now, it was lined with full one inch, one by 12 storm board, what they call it. They put it a diagonal. So that building was gonna be there through hell or high water, as you'd say. But um, the roof was tin, barn tin, was got from a local supplier, and the duct work. You wouldn't think a potato house needed duct work, but there was 12 inch duct work that came from a little furnace built under the front porch that he had to keep a fire in 24 hours a day that went into a manifold and then went back to a brick chimney in the back. And so you had the duct work that carried just light heat and um, it was sheet metal. And the bricks that the furnace were made out of, I'm sure, came out of the old house. But all of that's still there today and being worked on. But the family worked the neighbors worked, and they all did a good thing. And uh, one thing that you don't think about in storage to keep stuff safe would be a slatted floor. But it had to have a slatted floor to let the potato boxes or crates, potato crates as we call them, sit on there and the air to come up through them. So there was a slatted floor in it and they built out of these thin pieces of wood 1,000 potato crates, 1,000 mm. potato crates, and comes along Coca-Cola. They wanted to paint a sign. So on the north side and on the east side, they put W.E. Johnson Sweet Potato Curing and Storage and their Coca-Cola logo. And it's lasted, not that particular sign, but that logo has lasted all these years. And it's interesting, to, I mean, because Coca-Cola went around to a lot of buildings at that point. That's that right. was their form of advertising. I mean, like, that's why you see them on these little covered bridges and things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. You was, got your place preserved, and they got some advertising, advertising out, of out of it. But it is cool that they, I mean, because W.G. Thompson, maybe, or Johnson, never would have thought of advertising his, his himself. Right. Yeah, but they, just, they, 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 they definitely sweetened the pot by putting his name and his family's name on there. Absolutely. Now, you might ask, how much is Johnson getting for all this work? Thousand potato crates, he charged 15 cents a crate to keep them. Now, he had to manage these crates. Uh, the potatoes were planted in April, harvested in late September, early October. And if you had your potatoes drying and curing in six weeks, they'd be sweet. So by Thanksgiving or Christmas, you had some good stuff to eat. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't want to eat them all at once, or you might want to leave them in there when some of your neighbors came or somebody came and wanted to buy the potatoes. But 15 cents. And the first year, 80 families took advantage of his potato house. And the 1,000 potato crates were filled up in a flash. But he had room for more up in the attic. And so he told the other folks if they would build their own potato crates, he would store them. 15 cents, but he would store them. And he ended up with 1,300 potato crates in that little house. In that little house, yeah. You wouldn't think that, would you? Right. I mean, well, looking at it from the highway anyway. Now, you, ima you might imagine, why would people want to put their potatoes in a potato house? Well, no more digging, no more hilling, no more putting your potatoes in straw and covering it up with dirt, being susceptible to the weather or being susceptible to the vermits around digging in it. Mm -hmm. You could have a safe place for your crops for only 15 cents per bushel. But was it safe from bees? Well, now, there were, were bees that got in the back of the potato house after it closed. After, okay. Had, had bees come in, and uh, they built, and we had somebody to come along and rob the bees. And, in fact, cousin Alicia has them at her house right now, making honey, tater house honey. How about you? And uh, they smoked the pheromone smell out of the potato house and covered it with some metal. But it's all in good shape now. I want to take our uh, final break here. It's uh, 8.50. We'll come back with about eight, nine minutes on the program. Talked about the bees because that was, I think that was an issue maybe five, six years ago. Uh, there was a campaign to help save it, and uh, and it was successful. Another campaign is going on right now to uh, help uh, with, re with uh, refurnishing the place. Uh, not furnishing it, but uh, rehabilitating the outside and uh, things like that. And we'll talk about that, too, in, uh, in, in the third segment. Also, I just... The, the Coca-Cola sign out there. I think Coca-Cola painted that maybe up until the 1990s or something along those right. lines. But then, mm -hmm. yeah, we've had to take local artists who have been able to uh, redo that, and that costs money as well. So we'll talk about that uh, in that campaign in this final segment uh, when we come back in one minute. Community Voice brought to you by Tanner Health System and Oak Mountain Academy. 
Health is a journey. It's making better choices, even when it's not easy. It's taking care of yourself and the people you love. At Tanner Health System, we're there for you with every step, with primary care, heart care, cancer care, women's care, orthopedics, surgical services, and so much more. We're dedicated to helping you live and feel your best. So let's get on that journey to health. You've got places to be for many years to come. Find us at Tanner.org. World Language Scholar Journey at Oak Mountain Academy is designed to provide students with a clearly defined curriculum-based track to acquire essential knowledge and skills for success in biliteracy fields of study. The successful completion of this journey provides colleges with a method to recognize a rigorous foreign language immersion experience for all students at Oak Mountain Academy. I'm Patrick Uran, head of school, inviting you to journey with us on the mountain. For more information, visit us at oakmountain.us. Discover your journey at OMA. Prepare, explore, and achieve. Welcome back to the WLBB Community Voice News Talk, 1330 FM 106.3. My name is Colin Worthington. My guest this morning is Curtis Spivey. Also, thank you to uh, those of you watching on our uh, News Talk 1330 WLBB Facebook page. We're talking about the Johnson family history and uh, how they brought the Tater House to our community, an iconic uh, building that is in between uh, Carrollton and Roopville on Highway 27. Appreciate those of you watching on the News Talk 1330 WLBB Facebook page. A young man who uh, lives in Carrollton has sent me this message. His name is Jay Gill. He encourages me to ask Curtis if you've written down all of your history knowledge. And I know the answer is not all of it, but you've written down a lot of it. And uh, says you're also famous for doing a mule call. Um, I have not heard it, uh, but I might want to ask him to do it on the air. Don't work uh, anymore. Another day's gone. Okay. <laughs> and we'll, I mean, we've got six minutes left in the show, and I want to make sure that, well, although we could stretch it out, we've been doing that a lot lately, stretching the shows out past the 9 o'clock hour. But we'll uh, we'll try and get all the information we can here in the next seven uh, seven minutes um, and then get us to where we talk about the campaign to help as well. But, um, you know, that, that spot right there, that was, um, I, I'm guessing before, you know, the actual, was that considered an actual highway maybe? I mean, it was a, like a bus uh well, I'll go into that. In fact, when they built the Potato House in 1940, 27 was being paved, concrete. Now, I've heard stories about people coming from as far as Central Hatchie with their daddy on a buggy to trade something with Johnson. Maybe we had extra wheat. We could trade him for some of his potatoes because he did grow potatoes to sell after this. And uh, it was a hub of activity <clears throat> because on the southeastern motor lines owned by Mr. Roop, you could buy a ticket to the Tater House for a dime. And you that was actually to, the bus stop, the Tater House. The Tater House was, tater the bus house stop, was yeah. a bus stop. And uh, yeah. you could go down there and maybe get off and just walk to your house. But you could stop and buy some potatoes or just have some good conversation with Mr. Johnson. And if you ever talked with him one minute, he would share with you his faith in Jesus and quote you some scriptures because I have seen many King James versions that he had wore out thumbing through them and reading. He was an avid reader of the Bible. But it was a hub of activity, and it finally became the most photographed building barn in the state of Georgia. It has that reputation, the most photographed barn in the state of Georgia. And uh, I've been in restaurants all over this state and others, Mm -hmm. and you go to check out, and what's hanging behind the register? A picture of the Tater House. Absolutely. And it's it's very heart heartwarming. But the Berry College folks, and that may be part of the reason the highway is named Martha Berry How Martha Berry Memorial Highway, because folks came from everywhere and the Tater House was a destination. But um the Central Hatchie story, the the story of people coming to bring their potatoes, I would love to hear more of them if they could share with you or whatever, uh, because everybody that you ask in my church and other places, in businesses, everybody knows about Tater Johnson. Tater Johnson. And they didn't call him that in derision. That was an honored name, mm-hmm. Tater Johnson, because he was the man with the potatoes. But um, September, taters were coming in. They were being cured. And the people around there look forward to having a safe place to keep their product. And that was it? That was it. Uh, It it was open for 25 years, and in 1965 they closed it down. And by then, though, he had raised his price to 30 cents. (laughs) 30 cents, absolutely. And Horace had it repainted, uh, got what they think was the 
original painter to do the sign on it. And uh, then uh, they were going to try to remodel it again in the late 90s. They made 900 potato house Coca-Cola bottles. I've got some of them. They sold $10 a piece, or you wow. could get the cardboard carrier for an extra five. And the next day on the Internet, they were selling $50 a piece. The next day. So um, it was a destination. It was part of our history, and I hope it lives on. And it, there, the family does hope to make sure that it does live on. Uh, there's a campaign right now. I guess take us back. We've got about four minutes, but take us back to last week. I mean, there was some scuttlebutt on the uh, on the interwebs that uh, somebody knew for certain that they were tearing it down, and so it did upset some people. But then you did a little bit of research, and you found out, no, we're just uh, we're improving it. We're, we're maintaining this building. Right. Well, what they saw was the siding coming Cut off, off right, yeah. and so everybody was afraid of that. But uh, it is... There is a website that uh, you might mention there. The website is savethepotatohouse.com. That's right. All in small characters. Save the potato house. You can just make a small donation, too. Just, That's know, everybody right. Everybody may donate a dollar. Oh, if you donate $100, though, you can get a signed portrait of the house done by Alan Kuykendall. Oh, very cool. And uh, JFS Construction is doing the remodeling. They're doing a very capable job. They may be putting a coat of red paint on it today. I'm not sure. But uh, all, all fears will be quailed because in a few weeks it's going to look good. Yeah, yeah, Alicia said it would be probably two weeks from last week. So, yeah, right. within the next week or so, it could all be complete then? Well, uh, if we can get somebody to paint the Coca-Cola sign, it's going to be the biggest problem because Coca-Cola doesn't do that anymore. It's not in their budget. Yeah, but they're okay with somebody doing that, right? They're okay I'm, with I'm the free sure, advertising? I'm sure it's been... It's been taken care of. All right. Curtis Spivey, thank you for coming on the program this morning. You, uh, you, you've got four books out there uh, that you've put out. Three and, books. Three books. And, and then they're all three bound in one book. Now, okay. And, and I think I have that. Though. But you, um, I mean, you, don't, you don't mess with the Internet or anything. You're not putting your stories out there or even researching so much. On the, well, I guess if you go to the library. And, go to the library. Do a little read. I don't have a computer at home. And, and, the, and you're better off for that, I think. <laughs> if, yeah, if we all could avoid that, I think we'd be uh, in good shape. But it, plans for future books or anything like that? Well, I'm still in my old age. When I think of something, I make a note of it. <clears throat> and so there may be some stories. They might not be lengthy, but they might tell you something about somebody you had heard about. It, it, that's how I heard it, is, is one of your key Southern fans, stories, right? the way I heard it. Because folks say, well, my granddaddy said, no, this is the way I heard it. Yeah. All right, Curtis, thank you for doing this, and I hope the Johnson family appreciates you uh, sharing their story in good detail. I mean, I think we're all experts on it now, on the Johnson family and the uh, and the Tater House, and uh, the best news out of that is it's uh, the family does plan to keep it going for, you know. I think we the, need those contributions, the, you know, though. The quote it, was for at least the next 80 years, but, I'm you know, we'll pass it down to the next generation. That website, if you'd like to donate uh, even just a little bit or a whole bunch, as Curtis would a say. A big pile. Yeah, savethepotatohouse.com. Maybe we'll put it up on our uh, website or on the Facebook page with, uh, with this uh, stream on uh, the uh, Facebook page. Again, Curtis, thank you, sir. You're always a treasure. I'm always just blown away by your knowledge and uh, your ability to tell a story. And uh, thanks for every time you come on here and share stuff with thanks us. Thanks for the asking. Absolutely. And thank you for listening and watching this morning. As always, Community Voice is brought to you by Tanner Health System and Oak Mountain Academy. Hope everybody has a great weekend.